Hey, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for getting me your hypos number three on, on Tuesday. Appreciate that. I will uh, try to get them back to you as soon as possible. I hope everybody's doing okay with the current virus situation and staying safe. I think there may be some light at the end of the tunnel we're starting to see, so I'm hopeful. Anyway, um, today we're going to talk about fundamental corporate transactions. So far in the course, just to review, we've discussed corporate players, shareholders, directors, and officers, financial building blocks of the corporation, equity, debt, options, etc. We've talked about some of the purposes of corporations, conducting different types of businesses, trying to enhance shareholder value, of course, and in some cases, even furthering certain societal goals. We've also looked at some of the mechanisms for decision making within the corporation, specifically shareholder meetings, and board of directors meetings. In the context of some of the cases, actually a lot of the cases, we've heard mention of several different types of transactions, usually in the context of the fact that a shareholder has filed a suit in order to protest the transaction or how the transaction was handled um, when it was negotiated by the directors or officers. However, we really haven't spent any time talking about how these transactions are, are put together, how they're structured. Today, I wanna to talk, uh, step back a bit and, and, and take a look at, at some of the very basic types of fundamental corporate transactions. These are transactions in which you'll be involved if you happen to practice in this area of the law after you graduate um, as, a, as a specialist, as a, as a technician uh, who structures these. But as I think I said at the beginning of the course, you'll probably have to know these things if you're litigating cases that involve the subject matter of a corporate transaction. And that's quite common if you're a litigator in civil litigation. As a statutory framework, I'm going to refer to the Ohio General Corporation Law, Section 1701, of course. I think it makes sense to look at these transactions uh, conceptually in terms of a diagram. And so I've prepared a series of diagrams um, that I'll be displaying as I, as I talk about um, the different types of, of transactions that I want you to have an understanding of. This first one, of course, is one that we've, we've heard about before. Uh, we've seen it come up in a number of contexts. And uh, I'll just kind of review some of what we talked about and, and, and emphasize some aspects of tender offers that aren't necessarily apparent from the, uh, the work we've done so far. So let's walk through this diagram. So there's typically a third party offering to buy shares from the shareholders. I'll call that the acquirer in this case. Um, if the transaction meets the requirements of 1701.831, the Ohio Control Share Acquisition Statute, then we know that we have to, con we have to comply with that statute. Now, as we know from the detailed rules under 1701.831 and 1701.01, the definitions we looked at, not every transaction is going to qualify as a control share, control share acquisition tender offer. There are tender offers that, for whatever reason, won't fit within the rules of 831, in which case that regimen doesn't need to be complied with. Um, one thing that we, we talk about and we don't, haven't talked about yet, but we'll talk about now is when, when there are uh, exchange of shares between an acquiring company and a target company, there is typically securities laws implications from that transaction uh, because there can be, let's say, for instance, if we're talking about a, a share exchange tender offer, there might be shares that are issued by the acquirer to the target company's shareholders. That requires compliance with the Ohio Blue Sky Law that deals with, uh, it's the state law that deals with securities offerings. 1707.041 is the 
statute that you would have to comply with, aside from everything we've talked about so far. This is in addition to any acquiring person statement that the acquirer may be required to make if this is considered to be a control share acquisition transaction. Um, if you look at 1707.01v, I don't have the definition um, uh, up on screen, but I can describe it to you and you can look at this reference later. A control bid means the purchase of or offer to purchase any equity security of a subject company from a resident of this state, Ohio, if either of the following applies. After the purchase of that security, the offeror would be directly or indirectly the beneficial owner of more than 10% of any class of the issued not standing equity securities of the issuer, that's the target. And number two, the offeror, that is the, acqu the acquirer, um, is the subject company. There is a pending control bid by a person other than the issuer and the number of the issued not standing shares of the subject company would be reduced by more than 10%. So the point here is that in the tender offer context, there are specific securities laws that have to be complied with if it is deemed to be a control bid under the Ohio Blue Sky laws. So there has to be an actual tender to the target shareholders, of course. There has to be something offered to them. And of course, as I mentioned before, there's no guarantee that the tender offer will be successful. So as you can see in the diagram, the first step is an offer of money or shares in exchange for the target shareholders' shares. Perhaps the issuance of an acquiring person statement to the target if this is a 1701-831 transaction. If all of this goes forward, all the shares are, are offered and purchased, then at the end of the day, the acquirer now owns all the shares of the target company because they purchased them from the target shareholders. So that's the, the second step at the end of the day. You see what's going on there. A couple of takeover, a couple of takeaways from, from this particular transaction. Uh, as I said before, not all tender offers will trigger 1701.831. Um, you have to keep that in mind when you look at one of these, one of these deals. Number two, um, 1701, I'm sorry, 1707.041 is a separate set of rules specifically aimed at securities regulation uh, aside from the corporate governance aspects of a tender offer to purchase shares of a company. And number three, in cases involving interstate offerings, it may be necessary to comply with both state and federal law. In the, in the securities um, issuance, uh, issuances under 1707, we're assuming it's an intrastate offering. So that's something to keep in mind. There are possible implications uh, beyond just state securities laws. If the uh, offering is interstate, of course, if it is interstate, we also have to comply with the Williams Act, which is the federal version of these laws I've been talking about for the last five minutes. We've looked at the Williams Act before, deals with interstate tender offers only. And of course, as the lawyer, you are probably going to be expected to prepare the actual offering document, the tender offer document on behalf of your client it could be a letter, it could be a email. As we talked about before, there are a number of ways to communicate a tender offer. Again, assuming it's not interstate. If it's interstate, we know that there are specific requirements under the Williams Act as to how you must uh, make the offer to the target shareholders. In the case of a purely intrastate offering, we don't have those same requirements and your offer to the target shareholders may simply be a letter that you're writing that sets forth the terms of the offer, the duration of the offer, uh, etc. You may also be involved in preparing an issuing person statement if this is a 1701.831 transaction. And as we know from before, there's no form for that. This is something that you're going to write 
in a way that will incorporate the requirements of the statute. The next major transaction I want to talk about is something we all hear bantered around a lot. It's the word merger. What's a merger? We know generically it's, just, it's a combination of something, two things. Um, we're going to talk about it in a little more detail so that you understand exactly how this works. We've seen mergers mentioned uh, in a number of the cases, usually in the context of a transaction being challenged by dissident shareholders who don't believe that the terms of the merger are fair. Sometimes a party who initiates a tender offer receives enough shares in that first wave to force the target to agree to a merger with the acquirer. Let's assume they, tar they tendered for enough shares and own enough shares to replace some members of the board of directors. However, um, aside from that two-step process, most mergers are negotiated transactions. What is a merger? The short answer is a combination of two companies. Mergers are generally motivated by a variety of concerns based on the nature of the businesses involved. So here's some common rationale behind why companies merge in the first place. The first one I'll mention is, is something called a horizontal merger. This is a merger that involves the combining of two companies that are in direct competition with each other. In other words, they're trying to sell the same product to customers in a common market. Think of Chrysler merging with Fiat. Um, they were in the same business. They decided to combine forces to, to uh, be a more <clears throat> uh, powerful market participant. Second type of merger we see commonly is something called a vertical merger. So this type of merger involves, for instance, a company and one of its suppliers merging into a into one company. So let's let's look at Louisville Slugger Company makes baseball bats. Uh, they have a mill that makes these customized uh, wood products for them. That mill has been a outside service provider in the past, um, they decide to acquire through merger that company. And they've basically upstreamed part of their productive process into the Louisville Slugger Company. That might be done for a number of reasons. <clears throat> Cut out the overhead they've been paying to an outside company to, the, to eliminate the markup that the outside company has been charging them, for instance. A third type of merger that's fairly common is, is something called a market extension merger. This involves a combination of two companies that sell the same products, but in different markets. A market extension merger allows for the market that can be reached by each company to become larger. So imagine one company sells exclusively in South America, the other sells only in North America. By merging the two companies, and presumably eliminating some redundancies within their operations, they now have a much larger global reach. A fourth type of merger we commonly see is something called a product extension merger. <clears throat> this is a merger between two companies that sell different but somewhat related products in a common market. This type of transaction allows the new larger company to pool products and resources and sell them with greater success to the already common market that the two separate companies shared. For example, Suzuki Motorcycles merges with an automaker, resulting in the manufacture of Suzuki branded cars. And that, in fact, is what took place. Revised Code 1701.78 is the primary statute regulating mergers in Ohio. Again, I don't have the advantage of pulling this up onto the screen. Maybe I'll figure out how to do that later. Uh, but since I'm recording this, I'm a little bit limited in what I can do. I would highly recommend that you pull up this statute when you're preparing this section, because there will be questions on the exam that address 
uh, the statutes I'm talking about tonight. So how are mergers actually constructed? Well, there are two basic ways. A merger, as a merger, a true merger occurs when Corporation A merges into Corporation B. Corporation B still exists in, sub in substantially its original form, but Corporation A no longer exists as a separate entity. That's what we see on the screen here. Um, as you can see, uh, A company has shareholders, of course. B company has shareholders. And at the end of the day, A company basically disappears into B. B is this what we call the survivor. With its has its own shareholders, of course, and A dies, becomes defunct, and we'll talk about that um, in a little more detail in a, in a few minutes. The second type of transaction that's uh, sometimes called a merger is actually technically called a consolidation. Following a consolidation, both of the original companies cease to exist, and together they form an entirely new company. So in our diagram, we have A company and B company, like we had before. But instead of A disappearing into B as the survivor, they decide to together form NUCO. And they, the merger partners merge their companies into NUCO. So at the end of the day, the second, the second stage of this transaction is that uh, the shareholders of the merger partners become shareholders of NUCO. NUCO essentially now has two subsidiaries consisting of A and B. That is typically followed by a what we call a short form or a subsidiary merger under 170180. And at the end of the day, we have a group of shareholders who own shares in NUCO. So why would someone engage in this sort of consolidation? Well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of uh, each company feeling strongly that they should not lose their original identity, or at least not disappear into the other company. And therefore, it's considered fair to both parties in terms of, I don't say saving face, but saving face, to, to merge into a brand new company where they kind of start from scratch and jointly set, pol set policies. Um, it's more um, bilateral than a straight merger, the first one we looked at. Um, and I think you can see from the mechanics of, of how this works, um, there has an there's an exchange of shares into NUCO, um, resulting in, as I said, NUCO becoming the parent of these two new companies. As I mentioned before, mergers are generally negotiated transactions. While the parties may negotiate fairly hard, and while they may require shareholder approval, uh, which may or may not be given, and which may in fact result in litigation, as we've seen, these are essentially agreed transactions. One of the major advantages of a merger is that it can be uh, have the effect of being a tax-free transaction to the, to the merging partners. That is, when the merger is affected, even though shares may be exchanged for consideration in some sense, the tax laws generally do not require uh, target shareholders to recognize any gain as a result of the transaction. Uh, therefore, a merger is generally tax-free for federal income tax purposes. Um, if you're going to practice in this area, you should make a note of Internal Revenue Code Section 368. And you, you all know where to find the Internal Revenue Code in the uh, Code of, of uh, Federal Statutes. Section 368 spells out several flavors of this type of tax-free merger. And those of you taking corporate tax, or I think you call it tax two, will become familiar with the tax law considerations um, that often drive mergers. So you should be aware that Section 368 exists. You'll have clients and their accountants and their finance people who will be referring to it when they're considering entering into a merger transaction. So who receives what and from whom in one of these transactions? Well, there are a couple different 
ways this can happen. There can be share exchanges. In this scenario, the target shareholders typically trade their shares for either shares or cash from the acquirer or from the new co in, in the case of a consolidation based on a negotiated valuation process. And when I say negotiated valuation process, it's sometimes an exercise to uh, determine an apples to apples exchange of shares. And oftentimes it's not a one for one exchange of shares. If the companies are worth uh, different amounts of money, it may be, for instance, uh, an exchange of one of the uh, target company shares for, say, 0.9 shares of the acquiring company. And so a lot of time is spent coming up with a fair exchange rate in the case of a merger that's involving the exchange of shares. After the merger partners' respective boards of directors have negotiated the terms of the merger, the parties are required to prepare and file with the Secretary of State, and by the way, this is the case in every state, a document that reflects the agreement to merge the two corporations. Why is this? Well, as a result of the merger, one corporation, or maybe both, ceased to exist. And since we know corporations are creatures of state law, state law must be followed. Since the state has facilitated the, quote, birth, quote, of the corporation, the state needs to be formally advised as to the change of status of the corporation or corporations that are disappearing as a result of the transaction. And we'll look at that in a little more detail in a few minutes. Once the constituent companies have discussed the terms of the merger transaction, have decided on the appropriate consideration, timing, et cetera, there is typically a merger agreement that's created by the parties. 1701.78 called merger or consolidation into a domestic corporation provides the statutory mechanism for mergers of domestic corporations. This law contemplates a merger agreement between the parties that sets forth the items described in subsections 1701.78 B and C. Sections 1701.78 B is a listing of mandatory provisions that must be included in the merger agreement in order for it to comply with Ohio law. I'm going to mention some of the major ones, not all of them, but the ones that I think are important. Uh, number one, you need to state uh, the state uh, under the laws of which each constituent corporation exists. Um, they may be Ohio corporations, they may be an Ohio corporation and an Arkansas corporation, for instance. You must indicate whether the combined corporations will be a new entity, that is a consolidation, or whether one will be the survivor, that is a straight merger. You also need to indicate whose articles of incorporation will govern. That's important because that's the most fundamental uh, corporate document there is, the Articles of Incorporation. In the case of a consolidation, <clears throat> you must provide more detail regarding the actual content of the Articles of Incorporation for the consolidated new company. You must list the name and address of the statutory agent for the surviving company or the new company. In terms of the merger itself, you need to explain the consideration that's going to be exchanged between the companies. Is it, is it cash? Are they shares? If they're shares, what type of shares? Are they common shares? Are they preferred shares? Um, is there going to be any indebtedness involved in the exchange? Et cetera, et cetera. This is where you have a chance to really explain the financial uh, transaction that's taking place. Now, 1701.78 includes a provision for items that you may list, but are not required to list in the agreement of merger. 
In terms of the optional provisions under 170178C, you have the chance, you have the opportunity to indicate the effective date of the merger um, in case you want it to be a delayed effective date for whatever reason. Um, you can also include a provision that allows the directors to abandon the deal if something goes wrong. You also have the option to uh, list out the fair market value of the assets that will be owned by the surviving corporation uh, so that you have a record of what was given up in exchange for what. Um, you also have the option to list whose regulations are going to govern uh, post-closing. Remember the articles, whose, re whose articles must be stated, whose regulations or what regulations are going to apply may be stated in the merger agreement. And in the case of a consolidation, uh, you have the option to indicate the initial directors of the new corporation that you're forming as a result of the consolidation. You also have the option to indicate uh, the stated capital of each class of shares that are going to be uh, outstanding upon consummation of the merger. All of this, as you might expect, requires the approval of the directors and the shareholders due to the fundamental nature of these types of transactions and essentially existential concerns. Mergers must be approved by the directors of each of the merging corporations. Directors must approve merger transactions. Within 20 days of the director's approval of the merger, the shareholders of the corporation must be notified of the approval of the transaction by the directors. I'm referring here to 1701.78D. Once the shareholders have been notified of the approval of the transaction by the directors, um, the merger must be approved by two thirds of the shareholders of the, of the non-surviving corporation at a meeting that's held for that purpose. Now, this is an example of what we would call a super majority vote requirement a high vote requirement due to the important nature of a decision to merge a corporation out of existence. Two thirds shareholders of the shareholders have to approve it of the non surviving corporation. Now, the articles may provide for a lesser margin for approval, but it can't set forth less than a majority. So in other words, you could draft into your articles that um, only a majority is, is required in order to approve this type of transaction. But in the absence of that, the two thirds requirement contained in the statute applies. Now, significantly, the merger um, is sometimes required to be approved by the shareholders of the uh, surviving corporation as well in specific instances. So for instance, the articles or regulations of the surviving corporation may say something like, the corporation's shareholders always have the right to approve a merger transaction. Um, another instance where the surviving corporation shareholders may be required to vote is um, if the merger agreement uh, somehow modifies substantially the articles or regulations of the surviving corporation, assuming those are going to be the articles and regulations that are going to be uh, survive the transaction. Um, or if changes to the articles or regulations are made that would require shareholder vote, even in the absence of a merger. So for instance, and if you read the statute, you'll see all the, the language I'm paraphrasing to a certain extent. Let's say the merger agreement provides for the issuance of a new class of preferred shares to provide for the issuance of these new shares as part of the merger. Well, as we know, creating a new class of shares is essentially a modification of the Articles of Incorporation, which would require shareholder approval. Another instance where the surviving corporation shareholders may uh, be required to vote it is, is if the, as part of the transaction, the surviving corporation is issuing at least 16.6% of its shares to the other corporation's shareholders in the case of an exchange, for instance. It's described as one sixth of the voting power. 
And finally, the surviving corporation shareholders may be required to vote if the agreement of merger um, makes a change in the directors of the surviving corporation that would otherwise require action by the shareholders. So let's say the merger agreement uh, provides for an entirely new board of directors for the surviving corporation. Well, because shareholders of the surviving corporation are typically allowed to vote on those types of issues, they would be required to vote to approve the transaction containing that provision. In terms of procedure, in terms of how this gets teed up in the real world, um, the directors would convene a meeting of their number, um, given the amount of notice required by the corporation's code of regulations uh, or the applicable provisions of 1701, the way we have looked at that before, notifying directors of, of a meeting. At the convened directors meeting, the directors would pass resolutions authorizing the corporation's officers to consummate the transaction and to seek whatever shareholder approval might be required. As we know, these types of directors meetings can also take place by way of an action without a meeting under 1701.54, which is essentially written resolutions in lieu of convening an in-person meeting. Assuming the officers have negotiated the terms of the merger and assuming shareholder approval is required, um, the officers would then convene a meeting of shareholders, again, after giving the appropriate advance notice per the regulations or statute for the purpose of voting on the merger. We talked before about the requirements for convening a meeting of shareholders. Now, this is what we call a special meeting as opposed to a regular annual meeting, although it could be done at an annual shareholder meeting. We have statutes that we've looked at regarding giving notice to shareholders for a special meeting. That is the requirement for, for do, 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 do would apply in this particular case if we were seeking shareholder approval for this special transaction, this merger transaction. Once notice of the meeting is given, there would be the regular corporate shareholder voting uh, with or without proxies, um, as we've talked about in the context of 1701.49 through 5.2. Let's talk a little bit about the effect of a merger. Um, 1701.82 is the statute we have for guidance on this. According to 1701.82, and I'll read it, uh, here's the effect of a merger of the type that we just talked about. The separate existence of each constituent entity other than the surviving entity in a merger shall cease, except that wherever a conveyance, assignment, transfer, deed, or other instrument or act is necessary to vest property or rights in the surviving or new entity, the officers, general partners, or other authorized representatives of the respective constituent entities shall execute, acknowledge, and deliver those instruments to do those acts. For these purposes, the existence of the constituent entities and the authority of their respective officers continues despite the merger. So basically, the separate existence of the uh, non-surviving corporation goes away. Their officers are authorized, however, for the limited purposes of carrying through the merger to transfer of property, sign certain documents. Number two, the surviving or new entity, in the case of a consolidation, possesses all assets and property of every description and every interest in the assets and property, wherever located, of the constituent entity. In other words, the surviving company now owns everything that the disappearing company had before. And finally, and this is probably the most significant in some cases, the surviving entity is liable for all of the obligations of each company, including liability to dissenting shareholders, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. This last, this last factor, the inheritance of liabilities from the disappearing corporation is a major, major reason for determining uh, 
to not do a merger in many in many cases, uh, simply to not by law inherit the liabilities of the disappearing corporation. Now, as I said before, mergers are negotiated transactions. There are certainly instances where the negotiation requires that the surviving corporation agree to assume the obligations and liabilities of the disappearing corporation. Uh, but the preference for most buyers, and let's think of the surviving corporation kind of like a buyer, is to not inherit the liabilities of the company they're buying. And we'll talk about that again in a few minutes. We have pretty good Ohio law on this, this last um, principle. It is uh, coming from or uh, Accordia of Ohio versus Fischel. That's 133 Ohio State, 3rd, 356. The Ohio Supreme Court in Accordia of Ohio said, uh, we are, and this is a 2012 case, by the way, quote, we reassert that in accordance with Revised Code 1701.82A3, all assets and property, including employment agreements and contracts, and every interest in the assets and property of each constituent entity transfer through operation of law to the resulting company post-merger. The last point I want to mention in terms of the effect of a merger is in subsection 5 of that, of that statute that basically states that um, all rights of creditors of each constituent entity are preserved unimpaired and all liens upon the property of any constituent entity are preserved unimpaired. Uh, so essentially, um, this is to protect creditors who uh, would otherwise be out of luck if a disappearing corporation owed them money. Uh, this it makes it clear that the creditor can chase the resulting of surviving entity for payment. The last, the last uh, point I want to make here is that Corporations, if we when, we when we look at the form, or if you look at the form itself later, you'll see that corporations can merge with other types of legal entities. So, for instance, there can be a merger between a corporation and a limited liability company, between a corporation and a general partnership, between a corporation and a limited partnership. And that's something to keep in mind as your clients are discussing different types of merger transactions. Okay, so let's say we negotiated the merger, we signed a contract that complied with the contents of the merger agreement provisions we talked about. Uh, it was approved by the requisite vote of directors. It was approved by the requisite vote of shareholders um, of the, of the uh, surviving and perhaps also the disappearing corporation. Now, how do we indicate to the state that we have actually effected this fundamental transaction that may cause one of the state's uh, entities to, to not exist any longer. We have to file something called a certificate of merger. This is spelled out in section 1701.81 of the revised code. And this is Ohio Secretary of State form 154-MER. This is where we formally tell the state about the fact that uh, the entities have merged. So for instance, um, by the way, I'm not going to display the form because I have limitations in terms of what I can put on the PowerPoint. Uh, this form uh, should be on the website, but it certainly is available through the Ohio Secretary of State website, which you should be familiar with. So the certificate of merger indicates the names of the merging partners and the entity type of the surviving entity. Uh, we need to provide details regarding where the merging partners are incorporated uh, and uh, uh, where their articles are on file. We also have to indicate the effective date of the transaction. Again, this is separate from the merger agreement. This is the certificate of merger that goes to the state. And, and just an aside, the merger agreement itself does not get filed with the state, only the certificate of merger. Now, we do have to say in the certificate of merger where someone can find the merger agreement if they want to look at it. And typically it says that the merger agreement is on file with such and such an address that you list in the certificate of merger. This is so that if you're a shareholder who's not uh, actively involved in the corporation and you hear there is a merger, 
and maybe you missed the shareholder vote, you can find the merger agreement uh, if you contact the person who's listed in the certificate of merger. The certificate of merger also states that the parties who are signing this document have obtained the appropriate corporate approvals like we just talked about. Again, the state is not going to see copies of the director's resolutions. The state is not going to see minutes of a shareholder meeting um, regarding uh, the, the possible approval of the transaction. Uh, so they need for you to represent in that certificate that you have, in fact, obtained the, the appropriate approvals that were required by statute. If the entity, if there is, in, if the if the corporation has a disappearing entity, and it will in every case, either one corporation or two corporations disappearing, then there are certain additional requirements that have to be met, and the reason is. If a corporation is disappearing, it's as if it is going out of business and dissolving. Um, we're going to talk about this in more detail next week, but there are specific requirements uh, of a corporation who's going out of business to, through the Secretary of State's office to notify the state of um, when they went out of business, where the, where the um, uh, officers can be found in case there's still creditors out there, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So there are additional, significant additional requirements as, as it relates to the disappearing corporation or corporations. And finally, if the uh, survivor is a foreign corporation, and let's say that corporation is not an Ohio corporation, well, presumably the, the business operations, some business operations, are still taking place in Ohio then the surviving corporation now has to be qualified to do business in Ohio. And we've looked at that before. There's a, there's a procedure for a foreign corporation registering with the Secretary of State's office so that the Secretary of State can keep track of what they do. Um, that also is uh, a, a section of the certificate of merger to be completed if the survivor is in fact a foreign entity. I want to talk a little bit about uh, something called dissenter's rights. What are dissenter's rights? So what if your client doesn't like the price that's offered to shareholders in connection with a merger or another fundamental transaction? What if your client wants to maintain the autonomy, integrity of the corporation that they've invested in? What happens if your client's a shareholder who votes against the merger and what recourse do you have as a matter of corporation law? If you look at Ohio Revised Code section 170184, you'll see that uh, the statute provides that shareholders and companies participating in certain types of transactions are entitled to what we call dissenters' rights. In case if, if you don't approve a merger, now. Dissenters' rights is a way to express your belief as a shareholder that you're not being paid fairly for your shares, that the management of your corporation has approved and which perhaps a majority of the shareholders have also approved. Keep in mind that this doesn't apply to shares in a corporation that's publicly traded on a stock market. Why? Well, because there's already a ready market for you to liquidate your investment through the stock market itself. In private companies, you don't have the ability to liquidate your investment except in the context of one of these transactions or if the corporation decides to repurchase your shares through some kind of a negotiated arrangement. If you are under the category of shareholders uh, who are eligible to exercise dissenters' rights, Revised Code Section 170185 says that a dissenting shareholder is entitled to the, quote, fair cash value, end quote, of their shares. And those who dissent ostensibly believe that the proposed transaction does not offer them the, quote, fair cash value, end quote. Within 20 days of receiving a notice that the corporation is required to deliver to shareholders of the corporation that it has approved a merger in principle,
the dissenting shareholder must provide the corporation with written demand for payment of the fair cash value of the shareholder's shares. If the dissenting shareholder and the corporation can't come to agreement on what constitutes the fair cash value of the dissenter's shares, then either party can file a lawsuit to have the determination made by court-appointed appraisers. <clears throat> These are professionals hired by the court I'm sorry, hired by the court, but paid for by the company to come in and perform a valuation of the company. Remember, we talked before about valuation of private companies can be complicated depending on the type of business they are. Are they a service business? Are they an asset heavy business, et cetera? That, ex that exercise takes place if there is a court proceeding to have a valuation. Uh, shares of shares determined to determine fair cash value. The Ohio Supreme Court has weighed in on the issue of what constitutes fair cash value in the context of a merger. The fair cash value of a share is the amount that a willing seller who is under no compulsion to sell would be willing to accept and that a willing buyer who is under no compulsion to purchase would be willing to pay. But in no event shall the fair cash value of a share exceed the amount specified in the demand of the particular shareholder. In other words, you can demand what you think is the fair cash value. You're never entitled to more than that. And by the way, that could end up being more or less than the consideration that's being promised in the merger transaction. In computing fair cash value, any appreciation or depreci depreciation in the market value resulting from the proposal submitted to the, to the directors or to the shareholders shall be excluded. In other words, when a court engages in this exercise of valuing the company, they don't take into consideration any bump up in the stock price or the valuation because of the perception that the company is the subject of a possible transaction. Remember, even private companies' share prices can fluctuate based on a particular investor's perception of what's going on with the company, even if the company is not publicly traded. <clears throat> on the uh, class website, we have the Armstrong versus Marathon case uh, from 1987, around the same time as the CTS case that we looked at before uh, for the um, uh, control share acquisition statute. It's a very detailed, uh, explanation by the Ohio Supreme Court of how valuation of a private company should be conducted. Um, I'm not going to go through that case uh, on this on this presentation, but I recommend that you take a look at it uh, sometime before the final. As you know, a subsidiary is a company that is owned by another company. This occurs for a number of reasons. Typically, to separate the liabilities of a particular business line from the remainder of the business, it can also result if an acquirer purchases all of the shares of another company, but does not consolidate that company with the acquirer. And we've dealt with a number of wholly owned subsidiaries in this class before now. For other reasons, a parent corporation will sometimes want to merge the subsidiary into the parent corporation. Perhaps to simplify operations, reduce accounting and administrative costs, and perhaps for tax reasons. In that case, we have what is referred to as a parent subsidiary merger, also sometimes called a short form merger. And we see that is also addressed in section 1701.80 of the code. Let's talk a little bit about what the statute says. Um, I'll, I'm going to paraphrase 1701.80 because I know you'll look at it yourself later. <clears throat> um, subsection A of 1701.80 says that um, pursuant to a merger agreement, one or more uh, domestic or foreign subsidiaries can be merged into a domestic or foreign parent corporation, provided that the parent owns at least 90% of the shares of the subsidiary at least 90% of the shares of the subsidiary. My example shows a 100% wholly owned subsidiary, but it also applies if the parent only owns 90%, but at least 
90%. The statute also goes on to say that um, the agreement of merger uh, has to set forth the designation and number of the outstanding shares of the subsidiary and the number of shares owned by the parent corporation. It also provides that um, the merger agreement can set forth any of the provisions that we looked at before in 1701, 78B or C. And if uh, the surviving corporation is a domestic corporation, those apply if the surviving corporation the foreign corporation, we look to 1701.79 for certain specific provisions that have to be included there. In order to effect a short form merger or a sub parent merger, um, there has to be an agreement that's approved by the directors of each corporation, just like in the case of a regular merger. However, it doesn't have to be adopted by the shareholders of any of the corporations. In other words, the, the law specifically makes this a simple uh, transaction due to the fact that there are a limited number of shareholders uh, and that this is not an instance where we need to uh, enact the protection for shareholders that is manifested in the other statutes governing regular mergers. Uh, and then the approval of the agreement of merger by the directors uh, constitutes adoption of that agreement by the corporation. So that is a short form merger, only requires director vote. Subsidiary has to be at least 90% owned by the parent, has to be a merger agreement, but um, I think I have one of these on the website. It is a very simplistic uh, merger agreement because of the nature of the participants in that transaction. The next major corporate transaction I wanna talk about is probably one of the most common ones that we actually see in practice on a day-to-day -day basis in the business world, and that is an asset acquisition. So we talk about mergers and acquisitions. This is the acquisition time. What do we mean when we say an acquisition? An acquisition means the purchase by one business entity or individual of the assets of another business entity. So how is this different from a merger? Well, remember when corporations merge, their operations, ownership and liabilities also merge. There are also certain accounting effects triggered when companies merge. On the other hand, a purchase of all of the assets of another company is typically structured so that the acquiring entity, the buyer, assumes few, if any, of the acquired company's liabilities. The buyer can theoretically cherry pick the assets to get only the ones that it wants. And this is, in all cases, a negotiated transaction between the boards of the directors of the buying and selling corporations. So who receives what from whom? In an asset acquisition, the selling entity is typically selling all or substantially all of its assets. This can mean it's plant and equipment, intellectual property, the name of the business, raw materials, employment relationships, contract rights, litigation rights, accounts receivable, anything that a business consists of. The buyer pays the purchase price to the selling corporation, not its shareholders. At the end of the day, the selling entity may be little more than a shell of a corporation, which now holds cash or other consideration received from the buyer in exchange for the assets. And you can see in our diagram, uh, we have the fundamental transaction described as an exchange of assets for cash. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the, the approvals that are required for this type of a transaction. Um, if we look at 1701.76, that section is called sale or disposition of assets of corporation. These transactions must be approved by the directors of the selling corporation, of course, because they're selling the corporation's assets, which theoretically belong to the shareholders, 
and it has to be approved by the shareholders of the selling corporation by two thirds of the shares that are outstanding or such greater or lesser percentage as is provided in the Articles of Incorporation, but not less than a majority. Again, we have a high vote requirement, a super majority requirement by default, unless the corporation has purposely provided for a lower vote requirement, but not less than a majority. Corporate approvals are procedurally similar to those we discussed in the context of a merger. A formal board of directors meeting is convened and the issue is voted upon. A separate shareholders meeting is convened and the issue is voted upon by the shareholders. If both groups vote in favor of the sale, then the transaction proceeds toward closing. Shareholders who dissent to the deal are entitled to the dissenters rights remedy discussed in connection with mergers. If you look back at 1701.84, you'll see that transactions under 1701.76 are included in the category of shareholders who are entitled to dissenters rights under the statute. And of course, as we know, the statute that describes exactly what they get is 1701.85. So shareholders who dissent from this deal are entitled to certain rights. Well, if they are successful in suing for the fair value of, 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 of their shares, their, their, their proportion of the assets attributable to their shares, the shareholder is entitled to the cash purchase of its shares. Shareholders who vote in favor of the deal are not guaranteed any cash since the corporation gets the cash. So if the corporation has made some kind of an agreement with shareholders to distribute out the cash, that is one thing. But otherwise, the company could theoretically receive the cash for the sale and just sit on it or invest it in other businesses. And by the way, in some states, um, while allowing shareholders to vote on the sale of assets, don't grant dissenters rights to those who object to it. For instance, Delaware, the most prominent state that doesn't allow these sort of dissenters rights in the case of asset sales. Ohio does, and it does create some interesting wrinkles in the transaction. Directors have the ability to abandon the transaction at any time by statute, as long as this right is set forth in the asset purchase agreement or is conveyed by the shareholders at the time they approve the deal. Well, why is this important? If enough dissenting shareholders demand, quote, fair value, quote, which may require the company to pay out cash to the dissenters, or no matter how the deal turns out, expensive litigation, and the company can simply pull the plug on the deal if it has a problem with excessive assertion of dissenters' rights. Aside from compliance with this statute, nothing is filed with the state in connection with an asset acquisition transaction, since from a corporation standpoint, the two entities remain intact at the end of the transaction, buyer company in my diagram having cash, selling company, I'm sorry, buying, buying company having the assets, selling company is now a shell company that holds cash, but they still both exist as corporations. Therefore, the state really doesn't need to be notified of anything with respect to the transaction itself. I wanna talk a little bit about the, the components of an asset purchase transaction. These transactions typically start with something called a letter of intent. So I apologize for my babbling around, I lost pages on this one, sorry. Uh, so I wanna talk about the components of an asset purchase transaction. This typically starts, the transaction usually starts with something called a letter of intent. A letter of intent is what, like the name sounds, a letter written explaining in very general terms the purchase transaction that they want to they want to work on. Um, it will appear to be written by layman. It's intended to look like a layman and read like a layman document. Um, this is something that your clients will typically have put together maybe even without your input, because again, at this, at this stage, 
it's intended to be an agreement in principle between the parties to proceed in the direction of a transaction. Sometimes it's an opportunity to obtain the other person's commitment to, to proceed with the transaction. Maybe there's been a lot of talk about it, a lot of casual talk. Um, if, the part, if you can get the other side to agree to a letter of intent, it's usually a sign that the transaction is starting to proceed toward something real. It's also intended to highlight the major components of the transaction so that when it comes time to actually draft documents, we have somewhat of a roadmap, at least from 10,000 feet up, as to what we're talking about in terms of the deal. Not uncommon for a letter of intent to say that it is non-binding and subject to negotiation, drafting, and signature to definitive transaction documents. And that's in virtually every letter of intent. Sometimes a letter of intent will commit the selling party to not entertain any offers from anyone else other than the proposed buyer. Um, that is typically intended to assure that the buyer doesn't expend significant time and effort on the transaction only to have the, sell, the, the seller shop it around and sell to someone else. This is called a lockup provision and it's very common and typically is one of the provisions of a letter of intent that survive um, the, 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 the letter itself. Uh, there are also typically uh, confidentiality provisions in the letter of intent. These also tend to be provisions that survive the letter of intent no matter what. So there are some, some survivable or survivable, you know, some survivable provisions of letters of intent. The next thing that happens is the parties will typically start to do homework on each other. Most typically in an asset transaction, the seller is doing an investigation of the, the, of the buyer, buying company. And you'll be involved in this if you practice in this area. This is an opportunity to leave no stone unturned when looking at the company that you propose to buy. Um, and lawyers have very detailed extensive due diligence request lists that we prepare and send to companies. We typically customize them a bit based on the type of the, of the, of the uh, uh, company that's being purchased. Uh, and uh, it's a fairly systematic uh, process, but a really important one in order to avoid surprises once the transaction proceeds. Um, there can be inadvertent uh, failure to disclose information, some of it can be on purpose. Uh, due diligence is an opportunity for you to uh, start to, to learn that early on. Um, in the meantime, or at the same time, the parties may be drafting an asset purchase agreement. This is the contract that provides for the sale of the assets by the seller to the buyer. Um, it is a document created from scratch. There's no particular form for this. Um, I have hundreds of forms of asset purchase agreement and no two of them are alike, although all of them have at least one or two common provisions. Um, it is typically drafted by the buyer as a matter of custom and as a matter of practice. Uh, the buyer typically takes the first stab at drafting the contract with the understanding that it will be reviewed, commented upon by the selling company. The asset purchase agreement contains a number of really important provisions. Uh, and one of them, the first one is, uh, first of all, the first part of the contract will talk about who the parties are. The second part of the contract will talk about what is being sold and purchased, describing the assets. That all, and, the, and it'll also talk about the price that's being paid for the assets and how they're being paid. Maybe it's being paid all in cash at one time, Maybe it's being paid in cash at the closing and, and future cash based on whether the assets perform as was represented. Um, it may provide that there's a payment of cash and maybe even some shares of the buying company. Uh, all of these things can, can be baked into the, the first part of the asset purchase agreement where we talk about the assets and the purchase price. That's pretty straightforward. Um, a significant section, a really lengthy section of any asset purchase agreement is something called the representations and warranties. Short 
shorthand for that is reps and warranties. You'll see reps and warranties referred to or mentioned a lot in these transactions. This is where even though the buyer may have learned information about the selling company during due diligence, that was really for purposes of the buying corporation knowing whether they wanted to proceed at all. Um, if they found major problems during due diligence, they wouldn't even proceed the contract. But assuming they got through due diligence and wanted to proceed the contract, there are, there's a time in the contract where we are asking, we as buyer are asking the seller to make certain representations and warranties, basically promises, regarding the condition of the company's assets. So there will be representations and warranties regarding every aspect of the business that's selling and the assets that they're selling. So for instance, one representation will say, the buyer has been duly incorporated under the required laws. The transaction has been duly authorized by the requisite uh, deciding bodies, whether it's the shareholders or the directors or both. Um, it will say that this transaction does not violate any other transaction or arrangement to which the seller is a party, obviously important. Um, it will say things like our assets as we've listed them out in this attachment to the agreement are in good and working condition. We own them outright. There are no outstanding you know, problems with the machinery or equipment. Uh, we own the intellectual property. It doesn't infringe anybody else's intellectual property, so you're not gonna get sued. Uh, we own the building that you're buying. Uh, it's not in violation of any zoning laws. There are no unpaid property taxes. Uh, it'll say, this is the listing of our workforce and this is what we pay them. Uh, there nobody nobody has, has any pending lawsuits against the company for workers' comp or wrongful discharge. Um, and there's nobody who has accrued uh, vacation paid that, we, that hasn't been paid out by us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We could talk about reps and warranties for the next two hours, but suffice it to say, as a buyer, you want to make sure that the seller is putting in writing exactly what they're selling to you and the condition of what they're selling to you and making affirmative statements and promises that the assets are exactly as, as you perceive and that they say they are. Um, why is this important? Well, if it ends up that they were inaccurate, either by accident or, or, or intentionally representing a particular asset and it comes back to bite you, you have recourse against the seller. We'll talk about that again in a minute. So the reps and warranties are a very, very detailed listing of each of the assets, each component of the assets, quality of the assets. And in a perfect world, we would like the seller to say with respect to every category of assets that they're perfect. So for instance, they'll say something like regarding relationships with suppliers, let's say. It'll say something like, uh, to the seller's best knowledge, there are no lawsuits pending. There are no threats of any lawsuits by anyone, period. That's what we'd like you to say as, 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 a, as a buyer. However, that's not necessarily all, always realistic. And, we, and the buyer doesn't want to, the seller doesn't want to set itself up for being sued. So they may say something like, except as listed on attached schedule A, there are no lawsuits pending, no threatened, et cetera. And if you go back to Schedule A, which is what we call a disclosure schedule, it may list lawsuits that are in fact pending and it'll tell you about them. So you as a buyer have received a representation with an exception to that representation. All of those exceptions are listed on what we call the disclosure schedules. So the representations and warranties and the disclosure schedules work together to give the buyer a full picture of the assets. Um, the representations and warranties involve some negotiation as to how absolute the representation is. And then the disclosure schedules contain actual exceptions from those reps and warranties. With those two things in mind, the actual reps and warranties and the disclosure schedules, you as a buyer have a complete picture of what you're buying. Now, if you don't like what you see on one of the schedules, you don't have to do the deal, but it's, it's typical for the seller 
to represent to, pre to prepare the disclosure schedules since they are typically the ones with the best firsthand knowledge of their own company. So at the end of the day, there will be a, sec a set of disclosure schedules attached to the asset purchase agreement. And you as a lawyer will be asked at times to, to participate in, in, in pre preparing those disclosure schedules or at least coaching your client as to what should be in listed on the disclosure schedules. And that's super important. So we have the first part of the agreement describing the parties, describing the assets that are the subject of the transaction, describing the money that's being paid. Then we have reps and warranties regarding the assets you're buying. And we have disclosure schedules that may contain exceptions to those reps and warranties regarding the assets of the company. Another common section for these agreements is something called covenants. These are undertakings by the selling company or the buying company, depending on whose covenants they are, to do things. In other words, we're not representing anything to the other party, we're promising to do things. So for instance, there may be a covenant that says that when the deal is closed or consummated, the buying company covenants or agrees or promises to continue the employment of certain people who work for the uh, seller company. And again, this is usually negotiated. It may be that we as a buyer must have certain people stay on in order to bridge the transition from the uh, seller to the buyer company. We may need to bridge that transition with customers. We may need to have the seller's staff educate the buyer's staff about how the company works on certain levels. And so there might be a negotiation resulting in a covenant that the uh, selling company will, uh, certain people might be employed. There also is usually a covenant that the, and again a promise, that the selling company will continue to operate in the ordinary course of business through the closing. In other words, we don't want the selling company to go out and make a major sale of a major component of the business because that would impact what we thought we were buying. So there's usually an ordinary course of business covenant as well. And the covenants can go on and on and on. Um, they, all, they all tend to be uh, negotiated and they all tend to be deal specific. Although in the models you'll see uh, on the website, you can get a, a, a flavor for uh, the types of things that were at least uh, uh, requested as covenants in that transaction. Um, next, I wanna talk about um, some of these things called ancillary agreements. These are agreements that uh, are not the asset purchase agreement, but are part of the transaction of which the asset purchase agreement is the primary document. So for instance, in that covenant I just talked about where the uh, buyer is making a covenant to employ certain folks who work for the selling company, they may be agreeing to hire those folks pursuant to an employment agreement. And that employment agreement would be attached as an exhibit to the asset purchase agreement. So that is what we, that's an example of an ancillary agreement. It's not the main agreement, but it's, it's included in the transaction. Um, another covenant might be that upon closing, the buying company agrees to lease from the selling company the facility where they're located. Uh, maybe that they, they own it, um, they're not selling it to the buyer, but they'll lease it to them. So that might be an ancillary agreement to the main agreement, that is a lease between the buying company and the selling company who's now the landlord. Another example of an ancillary agreement we typically see is an agreement between principals of the selling company and the buying company that the principals of the selling company will not compete against the buyer. Um, buyers typically don't wanna pay money for a company only to have its principals set up shop next door the next day and compete against them. Um, Non-competition agreements are extremely common in these types of situations. Again, this would be considered an ancillary agreement that would be an exhibit to the asset purchase agreement itself. Uh, typically, a company that sells its business, sells its assets, is party to lots of contracts. 
those contracts, those contract rights are among the assets that are being purchased. You may be buying the company because they have a particular contract that you want. That could be the main reason. Typically, uh, there's a process for transferring a contract to which you're a party from you to a third party. And that's called assignment of the contract. Um, there are sometimes restrictions on whether a company can assign a contract, but let's assume it's assignable. There is commonly a contract that's part of one of these deals called an assignment agreement that uh, legally assigns contracts from the seller to the buyer and on the flip side obligates the buyer to assume those contracts so that if the selling company doesn't honor that contract in the future because they assigned it to the buyer, the selling company is not in trouble. They have documentation that was properly assigned and that the buyer assumed the obligations under the contract. That is typically an ancillary document in one of these transactions. Uh, let's see, we talked about consulting agreement, assignment, assumption, lease. Um, Oh, okay. The other thing I want to talk about is this concept of a closing. I keep mentioning closing uh, or consummation. This is the moment when the deal is done. Uh, money has changed hands. Assets are now titled in the name of the buyer. There may be bills of sale that have been exchanged. Um, it's a big deal. And in, in the old days, we used to do this literally around a table or we'd have all documents, all these documents we're talking about laid out for the parties to sign. And there would be a phone call to the bank and a wire transfer would be initiated. And when that was done, we were closed. Um, so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about closing. We're talking about the consummation of the transaction. The transfer of money is the most important part of that. Uh, and signing of some documents, usually at your office or at their office. Uh, but oftentimes you are asked to be the person who organizes that. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about closing. Um, another aspect that's in these contracts, these asset purchase agreements, is uh, something called an indemnification clause. We're going to talk about indemnification, I believe, next week. Basically, it's the concept that you are going to uh, back up what you say. So in the case of a, a seller, they are making representations to us, the buyer, about the business. They are representing all of these qualities of the assets. And if it ends up they're wrong, for whatever reason, and we get sued or, or suffer some other adverse consequence, we want to be held harmless. We want to be indemnified by the seller. That's what indemnification is about. It's about standing behind what it is that you are supposed to do uh, and what you're supposed to convey. A couple of concepts I want to talk about uh, in terms of indemnification. It's typical for parties to negotiate uh, some numerical thresholds for indemnification. So for instance, realizing that, especially with larger companies, that it's almost impossible to to think of every possible contingency and every possible wrinkle in disclosures, that there may be uh, small amounts that a buyer incurs because of the inaccuracy of a representation or warranty. Um, if it's a $50 million deal, we may uh, negotiate something called a floor saying that <clears throat> Once we have suffered $25,000 of harm because of the inaccuracy of a rep warranty, we can be indemnified by the seller. That's intended to prevent a situation where you're, the buyer is nickel and diming the seller every couple of weeks saying, oh yeah, another one of these claims came in. Um, negotiating a floor is a way to uh, simplify the process of making claims. Again, it's relative to the size of the deal Sometimes there's no floor. Sometimes it's you know from dollar one always. Some deal some deals have a floor, um, and after you reach in my example twenty five thousand, let's say you go twenty five thousand and one dollar, you can claim twenty five thousand and one dollar. Some deals after you hit twenty five thousand, 
then you can start claiming dollar one. So that's a wrinkle in terms of how these are negotiated. Um, sometimes there are, on the indemnification, there are um, uh, a sunset claim on it, a sunset provision, meaning indemnification only exists for a certain period of time after closing. Why is that? Well, as a as a, a a seller, you want to get out from under this. You're selling your company. You don't want to have to worry about claims coming back at you for the next 50 years. It's typical for the parties to negotiate what we call a survival period on reps and warranties, saying that you have to make a claim within X number of years. And that depends on the nature of the reps and warranties um, and the negotiation between the parties. But that idea of survival of reps and warranties for purposes of indemnification, extremely common. We lawyers spend a lot of time negotiating over it. Uh, so I did, I'm giving it to you as a heads up, something to be aware of that you'll probably be dealing with uh, sometime in the future when you get involved in drafting these documents. The last slide I wanna talk about is um, a couple of other just, um, I don't wanna call them asides, but these are issues that, that, that come up in the context of um, asset purchase transactions. They are uh, not always, they don't, they don't always have an impact, but they sometimes do, and you have to be aware of it. So for instance, I, I kind of alluded to the example earlier of what happens if you're buying assets that are the subject of a contract with a third party. Let's say the uh, selling company uh, leases their facility from a third party. You're not gonna buy the building, they're not gonna sell you the building because they don't own it but there is a lease in place. The question is, can that lease be assigned to you as the buyer? That's not always clear and it's not always permitted. So um, these are often what we call a condition to closing, is that um, we, are, we can't go to closing unless we have approval from some of these third parties whose consent is required. So that's something that you, again, as lawyer, pay attention to because you're reviewing all these contracts and seeing um, if these consents are required to go to closing. Um, another common, uh, I don't want to say restriction, but uh, a common issue that, that comes up you have to be mindful of is, does the uh, selling company have bank loans or loans from other third parties that require the consent of those lenders in order to sell the assets? Now, if I'm a lender to that company, I sure want to make sure I'm getting paid before they sell the assets out from under me. So, uh, being mindful of and negotiating payoff to these third party lenders is critical, super important part of these transactions, sometimes causes them to fall apart. Uh, same thing with respect to entities that lease important equipment to the, to the, uh, to the seller. There'll be major pieces of equipment. Um, I'm, I'm, I will, I'm certain that every one of those leases says that you can't assign this lease without consent, or you can't sell this equipment unless you pay us off. Uh, so those are things to be mindful of in terms of third party consents in this area of, of law. Just a couple of other points. Um, with respect to large transactions, and I'm talking about something called the Hart Scott Rodino Antitrust Improvements Act. Um, this, and I don't know if any of you have had uh, trade regulation or antitrust, uh, this law requires parties to certain mergers and acquisitions to notify the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department before consummating transactions that meet certain specific criteria, all of which are linked to the size of the transaction and are intended to prevent anti-competitive combinations of businesses. So a filing is required if three tests are met. Number one, the transaction affects commerce interstate commerce, because this is a federal law. Number two, either one of the parties has sales each year or assets of 126 million or more, and the other party has sales or assets of 12.6 million or more, or B, the amount of stock the acquirer has is valued at 252.3 million or more at any time and the value of the transaction is 66 million or more. Yeah, I know this is complicated and these numbers seem kind of random. They even change from time to time based on 
uh, how the economy changes. And so these are updated uh, fairly regularly uh, pursuant to regulations that, are, that the Justice Department administers and the Federal Trade Commission administer. Um, the, the, the takeaway is um, if you have two companies uh, who are from different states or they're involved in interstate commerce and the transaction is starting to look fairly large based on the numbers I just tossed out, so let's say a $66 million transaction, you need to be thinking about the Hart Scott Rodino law and, and whether you need to comply with it. What happens is that if you're if this is triggered, you have to make a filing with the FTC, you have to pay a hefty filing fee, it's, it's tens of thousands of dollars, and you have to wait for them to either bless the transaction or object to it. If they bless the transaction, you can proceed, but you don't get your money back from them. If they object, you've read about this in the paper where a certain transaction was approved subject to one of the partners selling off some of the assets before the transaction takes place, selling off the assets to a third party. So be aware of Hart Scott Rodino for large transactions. Another law I want to talk about is the plant closing law. It's, it's the WARN Act, W-A-R-N, that's the acronym, Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act. Um, this uh, basically is intended to uh, give heads up to employees that you're going to close the business. The Department of Labor uh, sees this uh, sees over this particular law. It impacts businesses with more than 100 full-time employees. So again, if you've got a transaction involving workforces that are fairly sizable, you need to be mindful of the WARN Act and you have to see whether you're complying with it or not. If you have to comply with it, you have to provide at least 60 days advance notice of plant closing to the workforce. Now, if workers will continue after the closing, in other words, the uh, buying company is going to continue the employment of these folks, which often happens. The statute's not triggered. So again, be mindful that for certain large transactions, you may have to comply with the WARN Act as well. All right. Uh, finally, I'm just giving you the slide uh, for the next to last week of the semester. Next week, we're going to talk about indemnification. Uh, in a kind of a different context than what we talked about it uh, tonight. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, corporate dissolution and winding down, which I alluded to earlier today when we were talking about companies merging out of existence. Um, as always, uh, you can reach me uh, at 216-635-0636. Uh, and that's all for tonight. Thank you.